It is NFL draft time, and for a Detroit Lions fan and a Miami Dolphins fan, this is our Super Bowl every year. The NFL draft where all 30 NFL teams choose from the best and brightest college athletes to fill out their rosters. Frank and I have always been fascinated by the draft and believe that there are many, many lessons that companies can take away from mistakes and positives, negatives that NFL teams go through in this very, very detailed hiring process. We had a blast making this one. Hope you like it. If you haven't subscribed, please do and share with your friends. We have a very crappy marketing budget. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. You can't say God Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Well, Pellegrino instead of coffee today. We're recording later in the day. There's no doubt. And uh, I don't want to have to get up suddenly and go pee. So I figured I would uh, I would just have a little bit of water. I can it. appreciate that. I'm on like a prison diet over here. It's NFL draft time, Frankie. It is. Is there a more exciting time of the year for Lions and Dolphins fans than the NFL draft? The day before the draft. So they haven't screwed up yet. It's it like, like, like the months leading up to it. It's where it's the only time of the NFL season where Browns and Jaguars and Dolphins and Lions fans are like the, uh, the talk of the league because everyone wants to know about our top picks. No one talks about the Patriots this time of year. No one talks about the Buccaneers. So last year was 2020. It was COVID. Like everything was going sideways. The NFL came out pretty, like everything was getting canceled still. And the NFL came out and said, uh, we're having our draft. It's all there is to it. We're having our draft. And it was a lot of back and forth. Should they do it? Should they not do it? And Zoom technology and all that stuff was pretty new. But what was really fascinating was the people who were supportive of it said, look, the draft is exactly what we need right now. It's hope. The draft is hope. It's, it's encouraging. It's fun. Like the bad news starts on the field. You break a, an ankle, you blow out an ACL, you lose. The player doesn't turn out great. But the draft is full of excitement. And there's seven rounds in the NFL draft. There's the first round which is where all the pomp and circumstance is and then every year it's a little bit different but there's like 260 picks and then there's mr irrelevant which is the last person selected but and we'll talk about this throughout the episode almost half of the nfl is made up of people who were never drafted so the draft is incredibly important but you also need to you know these are the people who went to big schools but people make the hall of fame who weren't drafted and we're going to talk about that as well so like don't be fooled by it, but it's a, it's a really exciting time and it's a really cool thing. And there's a lot of parallels between the NFL draft and business. I think, I think that's why we want to do this. Uh, Frank and I, for a decade, have talked about the NFL draft and we've talked about the teams that tend to get it right with selecting people and the ones that tend to get it wrong. And we also talk about the role of culture. So there are teams that actually get it right with the players, but then they get into their locker room and they quickly devolve with the culture that they've been brought into. So it's, I think the parallels are all over the place and we've got, we've got 11 very specific ones on this outline that we're going to talk about that are parallels of the NFL game and the draft to hiring from small startups to big fortune 500 companies. And Frank, take a guess, Frank, how many different countries has our podcast been downloaded in? 25? Wrong, 33, 33 countries. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are has anyone not from big America yet ever, in- Has anyone not, from America downloaded this? <laughs> we're not big yet in Iraq, um, but we are big in Iran. Uh, we've got over 11 downloads in Iran. Uh, uh, wild, I think because we talk about football too much, but we're not big in Canada. So I think we should do an NHL draft after this. But Canada has not picked up on our vibe yet, but they will. They will for sure. 
Can or Canadian Football League. So one other thing before we get d- d- dive into this, like I am a draft nut. Like I've always been a draft nut. I was a draft nut back in college. Um, like I remember it, it used to just be on like a, literally used to be on like a Sunday and then they moved it to like Saturday and Sunday. And then it went to like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it, they, they turned it into a TV spectacle and, um, it, it's, it's a pretty cool thing that, that, that they do. But, um, before I even knew Ian, I, I had a friend that I went and watched the draft with. Like, I remember one year there was like this big thing in Virginia, you know, it's the end of April, the weather's starting to get nice. Like I sat on the couch for two days and watched the draft instead of going to like a drinking festival with a bunch of friends or all like all thought I was nuts. Like the draft is cool. And the draft also teaches you, if you pay attention to it, the organizations that are always good, the Patriots, the Steelers, the team, the Cowboys have kind of been a hot mess for a while. So Packers. Too, the Packers, like teams that are just smart. Like the Packers is a perfect one to bring up. Like I remember being in my late twenties and they drafted Aaron Rodgers, and you're like, why the hell did they draft Aaron Rodgers? They got Brett Favre. And what it, what it teaches you, if you aren't a sophisticated business person yet, this is high stakes, big business, multi-billion dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies. So they're thinking about things into the future. It's gotten more complicated with the salary cap. So you have to look at like, what are you actually going to be able to retain three and five years from now? So if you pay attention to it, it teaches you things that you can implement in your career and you can implement into a business if you're a business owner or a hiring manager because they're doing at the highest possible stakes. People's careers in real life are in the 40 year range. Like you start in the workforce at 22, you retire at 65, that's 43 years. The NFL's average career length is under four years. So it's a crucible. And if you pay attention to this, it can teach you incredible lessons. And you're also, so these NFL teams are also paying entry level employees, multi-million dollar contracts. So the stakes are so much higher than hiring a salesperson or hiring an inside staff. Um, But part of the reason why I mentioned that we have 33 different countries that have downloaded it, of which 30 don't understand the American game of football I think it's worth just explaining what the NFL draft is to an extent. So uh, in American football, there's 30 professional football teams. And based on your record, any given year, it goes from the worst team to the best. So the worst team will get the number one draft the next year. And the idea of the NFL, American football, that they believe that the league is better when there's parity, when uh, you know their, their motto is any given Sunday. And the NFL likes it that way. They don't like blowouts. They know that you'll stay tuned and you'll watch through the fourth quarter if it's a close game um, rather than one team beating another 35 to nothing. So the NFL loves parity. And so they try to make teams like my favorite team, the Detroit Lions, and Frank's favorite team, the Miami Dolphins, more competitive. And as hard as they try, they've not been capable of doing this for 30 years. But that's the draft. So in that year, there are seven rounds. Any given team can, you know, if, if there are no trades, if you haven't traded away your picks, which you can do, you will get seven, seven different players and your ranking is based on how crappy you were the year before, how good you were the year before. So that's the way the NFL draft works um, and it happens every April. And so it lets teams that have struggled for a while, presumably if you've been really bad for a while, you're getting one of the best players in the draft every year, it should make your team better absent, you know, terrible coaching, terrible culture, all the other things we talked about. So the number one thing we talked about uh, as Frank and I were, were getting ready for this episode is the teams that focus on actual game film versus those that focus on the combine. Um, and the combine, for those that don't understand what that is, it is a uh, – two day event that happens, you know, a few months before the draft where all of these college players come and they show their athleticism. They, they are measured on their height, their weight, how high they can jump, how strong they are, their bench press, their speed. Um, And all of those numbers are then tracked against historical players. So there's a lot of data on, you know, each player as an athlete, their intelligence, they take IQ tests. It's, it's pretty in depth. Um, And, no one really skips the draft. I mean, you have to be a pretty, or a combine, you have to be a pretty incredible player to say, I'm out, I'm not going. 
Um, so the data is all there. Um, and some teams are very crazy about the data and other teams look at it as a data point, but really care about the game film. And there's a couple of players as examples. So Terrell Suggs is one of my favorite all-time players. And, and this, the two players I'm going to bring up, Frankie, uh, happen to just be players that are kind of, I'm close to it. But I remember he set a record for sacks, the NCAA record. Dude sacked quarterbacks 24 times in a season. And there's only like 12 games. So he's averaging two sacks a game, which if you've never played football, sacking a quarterback is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And when you're a player like Terrell Suggs, normally they're blocking you with two people and running away from you and finding ways to not let you do it. Yeah. It, mo most importantly, they're running in the opposite direction of where you line up to prevent you from getting a sack. And he still did it 24 times. He, he his stats, he's one of the most productive uh, defensive players in the history of college football. He had 66 tackles for a loss in his career. He was just a game wrecker on a strong team in a strong, uh, strong division. And then he went to the combine. So, so all of the buzz was he was going to go top three or four. He, you know, could have gone number one based on his, his playing. But then he went to the combine and he ran an incredibly slow 40 yard dash. So he ran like a 4.84 40 yard dash which is, you know, incredibly fast if your name is Ian or Frank, but for, you know, an elite defensive end, it's not fast. It's correct. pretty slow um, for his position. Um, and he only bench pressed 225 18 times. I say only because, again, I'm not benching that right now, but versus other people that was really low from a yardstick. So he had about as bad of a combine as you could have. And word started getting around. He's, he might be lazy. He might just be slow. Right. He might have played, he might have stacked up his numbers against inferior talent. And so the Lions had the number two pick that year. They took a guy by the name of Charles Rogers, who ended up smoking so much weed that he was out of the league two years later. And we couldn't even recoup our signing bonus on him. The Saints and the Jets desperately needed defensive help that year. And instead of Suggs, they took a couple of defensive tackles that never made a Pro Bowl, never made an impact. Both of them were out of the league within a couple of years. Multiple great teams passed on that need a defense passed on Suggs. Long and the short of it, T Sizzle ended up going to Baltimore. He was just an animal for, you know, he won two Super Bowls, Hall of Fame career. And his quote was great um, when, when asked about his combine. He said, you know, there's a difference between track speed and football speed. Watch my tape. And I just love watch my tape because. Once he got in the league, his tape was the exact same. He just terrorized. He just did it at a different level. He sacked quarterbacks. And that is one of the most valuable things you can do in the NFL is sack quarterbacks. Let me, uh, let me have a little fun with this. Two-time two Super Bowl champ, defensive player of the year 2011, NFL defensive rookie of the year 2003, first team all pro, which is like you're the best, of the, you're the best at your position, 2011. Second team all pro 2008, seven time pro bowler, and he's in the hundred sack club, which only has a handful of members. So crushed it. And but he ran a slow 40, Frank. That's he it. Ran a, ran a slow 40 yard dash. Exactly. So I think, you know, the, the lesson there is pay attention to what people have done. If they, 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 you know, I, as I hear that, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that don't interview that well. They just, they're awkward. Maybe they're not, that's not what you're hiring them for. It happens all so, the time. So let's talk about this a little bit, right? When you're hiring somebody, most of us use behavioral interviewing. The tape is the resume. The tape is the stories they're telling you. The tape is different things that are in the interview process that you are, it's, it's not as well publicized. You can't go to CBS or YouTube and see these things. Like, what did you do in the, you know, with your TPS reports? But what you can do is you can get at stories and find out where their recipes like, do they, have they uncovered the recipe? The recipe is I identify the problem. I do research. I talk to people. I implement, I adjust. I did it. And you do that over and over and over. That's the equivalent of getting 24 sacks in college. That's the stuff that you need to pull out of someone in an interview. Let's move to Drew Brees because you don't know this, but I have a story about him too. Ooh, Purdue Boilermaker. Yep. Go ahead. 
Why you first. You tell your story about Drew. No, Brees no, no. You first. You who. first. You Frank. First. Do you know who the all-time NFL passing leader is? Drew Brees. Drew Brees. That's right. Drew Brees has uh, like 15 different NFL passing records. One of the most prolific passers ever. 20 years in the league. He's a surefire Hall of Famer. Won a Super Bowl, the first one ever for New Orleans. Savior of the town. But Drew Brees is only six feet tall in cleats. When I say in cleats, I've stood next to Drew Brees at a party in college. He's about my height, and I am not six feet tall, even though I try to make people believe I'm close. Memorialized by the fact that an annual meeting in circa 2006, our uh, regional president at the time got a ladder out and gave it to Ian while he was in the middle of his speech. He goes, here, stand on this so people could see you. That son of a gun. <laughs> it was incredible. It was really hard to recover from that after that. I had to give a 15-minute presentation afterward. Um, so people thought, well, Drew Brees, he can't throw hard enough. He's not big. He doesn't look the part. Um, but all Drew Brees did in college was break every NCAA record, just like he did in the NFL and took Purdue to the first Rose Bowl in 50 years, damn near single-handedly throwing the ball 50, 60 times a game. One of the most accurate guys ever. And teams like the Browns, the Bears, the Lions, the Redskins, these are franchises that have never had a good quarterback. I mean, ever. That's the, the Bears have had like 30 quarterbacks in the last 30 years. It's so bad. They all passed on him in the first round. He didn't go until the first pick of the second round, and it's because his measurables didn't look good. No one was looking at the game tape. What has this guy actually accomplished? You know who the Dolphins selected in round one of the 2001 NFL draft? I'd like to know. Jamar Fletcher. Do you know who they didn't pick? Drew fucking Breeze. Not only that, Drew Breeze went to the Chargers. He was great. And then the Dolphins didn't sign him a second time. They picked Dante Culpepper, who blew out his freaking knee. And then he was out of the league two years later, and Drew Breeze ended up playing for the, the same. The Dolphins player. had two chances at Drew Breeze. They couldn't two meet chances. up for it because he lit it up in San Diego. He just got himself hurt, but he lit it up a second time. They had two the Dolphins, data the Dolphins, points. The Dolphins doctors wouldn't clear him because of his shoulder. So he went to New Orleans after the Dolphins, and Sean Payton sat him down, and they were together for like four hours. And the last thing Sean Payton, like the last thing Drew Brees asked me, he goes, you're not going to talk to me about my shoulder? He goes, no, he can play football. You'll be fine. All I care about is the football. And he ended up being a 15-year player there. Like incredible. So the Dolphins have been looking for a quarterback since I was 11 years old. They have not found him since Dan Marino is retired. They had their opportunity one year after Dan Marino retired and they drafted Jamar Fletcher. Combined, Charles Rogers and Jamar Fletcher played in the NFL for like six years. Well, I, like that's awful. I, I, you, can, you can understand a little bit why the Lions passed on him because they had Joey Harrington. So they had a future <laughs> Hall of Famer already in their stable. So you can understand why they would pass. Because they had a future college football announcer. It's understandable. It's understandable. So I think Nicole and I still joke about that. We're like, freaking Javar Fletcher. The point we're probably pounding home here is it's easy to get caught up in bias. Someone looks the part. Someone's tall, they're handsome, they're out of, they're out of uh, central casting when they come in, they're polished, they're smooth, their resume looks great, right? They've written it perfectly. But an, an interviewer has to ask specific questions. So we don't have game tape on people. But what we do have, Frank, is an ability to ask questions, to put people on the spot, to prove to us that they've been in situations where they've displayed behaviors that we value in our employees, right? Yep. So tell me about a time where you failed and you had to overcome something. Tell me about a time where something fell through the cracks and you had to put a system in place. Those are behavioral questions and a great interviewer can spend an hour and learn someone's game tape just through their questions. There's another side of this that we'll get into later. This is also an imperfect process. There's other people who are the opposite of Terrell Suggs and Drew Brees that were perfect in every statistical category. The tape was great and they flopped. So it's really hard to evaluate talent. People who are great at it and are paid millions and millions of dollars, we get to sit back and play Monday morning quarterback and tell them they're morons. But the truth of the matter is it's really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And there's, you know, other things you can do other than behavioral interviewing, you can check references, you can get referrals. That's why employee referrals tend to stick in companies. I bet you love employee referrals, Frank. I, just about every company does, right? When someone refers someone 
typically they're pretty good because they know them and they don't want to put their name on it unless they're good. We hire almost, I would say 25% of our staff through referrals. Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. So number two, looks can be deceiving. Um, so we're going to look at, so those are some misses that we looked at where someone should have looked at their game tape, but a couple of other examples that are striking where someone had an incredible combine. So let's look at the other side of this. Um, guy by the name of uh, Denatri Poe, um, he got written up before his junior year as one of the 10 strongest men in college football. So he, the buzz was already moving on, you know, his, his athletic prowess. But he played for a small Memphis school and he had a total of five sacks in three years. So again, Terrell Suggs had 24 in one year, 66 tackles for a loss in his career. This dude had five sacks, but he was really strong, right? And he played against subpar competition. So they were thinking this guy might go in the third or fourth round because he was a big body. Um, but the buzz picked back up when he went to the combine. So he went to the combine, he ran a sub five 40 yard dash weighing 330 pounds. So he pretty much ran the same 40 yard dash that Terrell Suggs did, but he was about a hundred pounds heavier, which is absolutely incredible. <laughs> um, and he bench pressed 225 44 times, which if you're doing the math, that's 26 more times than Terrell Suggs could do it. Um, so as an athlete, he was an absolute freak. Um, and so that buzz got louder and louder, even though the guy hadn't produced anything in college that was that impressive. And he went from being a mid fourth, fifth rounder to a first rounder. And in his career, he averaged two sacks per season and never made a Pro Bowl. And it Pretty good example on the other side of it, of the game tape didn't match, but he had the measurables, so everyone got excited. And the other one that's like this is Darius Hayward Bay. Um, he's a guy that was incredibly fast, um, but he averaged like three and a half catches per game in college playing for Maryland. Um, had a few long catches every year that would make a highlight reel, so people knew about him. And then he ran a 4.3 40-yard dash, which is – insanely fast one of the fastest ever of all the people to ever run it um and he jumped you know something crazy like 40 inches at the combine and oakland you know he went from being a third rounder to oakland being so excited about his athletic talents that they took him seventh overall and in four seasons he scored a total of 11 touchdowns and in six more seasons he never scored more than two in a year the guy kind of sucked as a receiver and that's kind of what he was in Maryland. That's it. His NFL game tape matched his college game tape. And, and, and in fairness with that one, he was drafted by the Raiders when Al Davis was fairly senile. Al Davis is the owner. Al Davis was a cutting edge pioneer in football 60 years earlier, but he was way past his prime. He got excited by this and he drafted him. And that's why Oakland was, they've now moved to a different city, but they were terrible for a long time because they made emotional picks like that. Well, um, Oakland based on it. So that's good. So managers have preferences, right? They have their, their pet peeves. They have things that they like. Um, right. Al Davis was always big. Always speed, wanted speed. Right. Speed. He hired James Jett. He's hired former Olympic guys that never even played football and tried to put him on the field. Largely it's failed, you know, for him most of the time, but he always put speed ahead of just about everything. So let's talk about this for a second. You go into a company and you do research, you do real research. You figure out what that company really likes and you give them what they like in an interview. You can't fake speed. But you can highlight in an interview what's important to different companies. If you read their core values and you understand what those core values are, the core value of the Raiders was just win baby and speed. Those are the two things. You come in as a winner. You come in really fast. They'll draft you three, four rounds ahead, which in the course of your life means tens of millions of dollars. If you're an interview candidate and you're thinking like, how do I get into this company? Position yourself. Don't use the same cover letter over and over again. Use a cover letter that's specific to that company. Use examples in your story that are relevant to that company. Do your research. Be prepared. Make yourself seem incredible while you're answering those questions, and you'll put yourself in a positive light, and you might get selected where if you hadn't done those things, you won't. And, and in most, so I love what Frank's saying here. So if you are in an interview situation, 
you're you're typically not just going to interview one manager. You're going to usually interview on a panel, two or three. And normally, your first interview is someone junior. Um, you know, w- when I interview, I'm usually not the first interview. Normally, if someone's going to waste their time, it's not going to be me. So everyone's been stuck in an interview where you're like, that's not going to work. I'd rather that be the lowest paid person who's on the interview panel that wasted their time. So if your first interview you should ask as many questions as you can about the type of criteria that company values. Ask questions like people who get promoted around here, what are the attributes that they have? Um, When you hire, what are the things that you look for in a great hire? Who who around here are some of your highest paid people? What What is it that they do differently? You're gaining insight so that in each subsequent interview, you can be a little smarter about how you position yourself, about the stories you tell, about the things that you do. And Frankie, you've got a good example of a guy who figured out the, the, the test grades and what the testers were looking for and gamed the system. So before I get into him, I'll say one more thing. They build on what Ian just said. In most companies, you do a phone interview first. Then you might do a Zoom interview in the 21st century, and then you'll do an in-person interview get smarter, like learn in the first interview. Don't be lazy and just answer a bunch of questions. Ask what's important, do that stuff. And then when you get to the second interview, you built your talk track around what was important in the first one and ask more questions. And then when you get brought into the office, keep getting better. And that that was perfect. Like you're going to, if you come here to work, you're probably going to interview with a minimum of three people, most likely six you can get better in each interview. And then if you finish with me and you blow me away with understanding great examples, like I could come into the room and you could have been a no and you blew me away. There will be a really strong conversation about considering you because of the fact that you did such a great job. You peaked at the combine and you're going to be considered. Speaking of peaking at the combine, my favorite story, I was in college. Um, Mike Mamula is the guy's name. Now, this guy was a good player, similar to college, right? Similar to the um, um, Don Terry Poe that Ian mentioned a second ago. He was a second, third rounder, most likely. And he goes to the combine and he just kills it. Ultimately, he gets drafted seventh overall by the Eagles. And he ended up being like a six sack a year guy. He ends up having a, a fairly decent career, but he wasn't incredible. He was just decent. But what he did, which was brilliant is he focused on something very different than everybody else that was a contemporary of his. He's a really smart guy. It's hard to get into Boston College. Like it's an academic school. So what he did is he looked at it and said, you can really distinguish yourself if you do great at the combine. So what he focused on was combine specific stuff. He worked on his bench press, his 40 yard dash, his testing, they call it a wonder lick, which is basically an IQ score. He got the second best wonder look in the history of the combine so he was, he was prepping smart. for it like you would an lsat right taking prep tests and he was smart to begin with which helps but then he was really smart in how he positioned his efforts and what ultimately happened is he got drafted seventh overall and i'll tell you just a quick story the seventh pick belonged to the tampa bay buccaneers they traded out so they got more picks because they didn't like mamula they liked a couple of other players better One of the players they loved was a guy named Warren Sapp who had character issues. It turns out he popped positive for a marijuana test. So he was the number one overall talent. He went 12th to Tampa. Tampa also traded that pick into a later round pick. They used a fifth round pick on a guy that they thought graded better. His name was Derek Brooks. The summary of this story is when Mamula came up on stage seventh overall Paul Tagliabue, who is the NFL commissioner, mispronounced his name. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the laughing stock of football for three decades, ultimately won a Super Bowl with those two guys who both ended up in the Hall of Fame. So they were really smart. They were a bad business for years. They finally had new leadership and new management said, we're not going to fall for the fool's gold. We're not going to put too much priority on this one event. We're going to look at the game film. We're going to take a character guy who's fallen back a bit, but is incredibly talented. And we're going to take an incredibly talented guy that fits our system built around them. And that's how you can do it. And you can replicate that in business. I think there's a couple of things that 
you know, could relate to someone who's, you know, a business owner or a manager who's hiring. Um, one of them is a just like me bias where we, um, we meet someone and they've got a lot of things that, you know, they might be like for Frank, it might be someone from Southern Florida or someone who played high school football, or, you know, there's, there's two or three data points that pop in there that are similar to Frank's background. Maybe they worked for a big builder or they did something else. Maybe they're Italian. It doesn't matter, but you kind of see them. You're like, Oh, this person's a lot like me. So obviously they'll be great. Um, and it's a very dangerous bias because it rarely works out the way you think it is. Cause you just don't have enough information. And the other thing I think about right away are managers that put way too much weight on GPA. Um, so Mike Mamula ran a really fast 40 yard dash. That's one data point. Some people are crazy about GPA. You've got to be, you know, up over a 3.6 or a 3.7. Um, it's funny, I, you know, uh, keep our, our car uh, alarm company. David is big on, on GPA, real big, way bigger than I am. He's crazy about it. Um, no, he's hiring some engineers that are inventing some pretty thorny things and thinking them through. So I kind of understand that, but some of it is the, just like me, David had an amazing GPA in college. I did not. So I don't value it the same way as he, cause I know what someone with a lower GPA is capable of. Um, whereas then that's what he knows. So those are a few things that I kind of took away from that second point. Yeah, and I, th I, I think the way that you brought those up is, is, a, is a good way to do it. So I texted Ian over the weekend, and this is you know how podcasts start with us. The draft is coming up, and I was listening to a couple of podcasts, and I listened to a podcast that led me to a podcast by Bill Polian. Bill Polian is a Hall of Famer. He's worked with some of the best teams. He was in the back office for the Bills teams that went to four straight Super Bowls. They lost all four, but they were really good. Um, he was the architect of the Peyton Manning led Indianapolis Colts. Um, and he's just looked at as a brilliant insider. And if you're a football geek, you should listen to it. It's really cool. It's from the beginning of April, 2020. It's, it, it's fascinating. But if you're not a football geek, this is what he, he did that I thought was incredible. He would tell you every position inside of a football team. And he would tell you the measurables that you needed to have so height weight speed agility all these different things they're all measured and he would know your height to the fraction of an inch like and he, he would use it in decimal points and it was like from 6.01 to one two to like 6.42 like in it, it, it for those of us in america we do not measure in points we measure in in inches, but they was like, it was, it was decimalized. It was so precise. And what was fascinating was he talked about red marks. So if you were too fat, too heavy, too short, too tall, too slow, your vertical stunk, you get a red mark. And what it was is you wouldn't pick somebody that had more than two red marks. And if you didn't pick them, you'd want to use it in a later round or you try something, but it was like, you knew that it wouldn't work. So to Ian's point about Poe, the defensive tackle, he talked about people that were too fat, too heavy. They played against inferior competition and how it just wouldn't translate. What I think in my business, I'm not nearly as sophisticated as the NFL, but what we do is we, the hardest thing for us to hire for Ian is sales. So we now use four psychological tests. And with those four psychological tests, we look at four things. What is your PI, your predictive index? Like what makeup are you? What is your cognitive? Your cognitive is how big is your sponge? Your IQ is how much water is in the sponge. Your cognitive is how big is the sponge? Like how much can you comprehend? I care about Two other things from this 19 page test. Do you take responsibility and are you coachable? You gotta be moderately intelligent. You need to show some aptitude for the job. But if you've got those four things, mm. I can turn you into a salesman. It's no different than if I showed up on an NFL report, no way in hell they're gonna draft me. I wasn't invited by the way to the draft or the combine, because I don't have any of those tangibles. So what are the things in your life as a manager or as a business owner 
that you need to focus on. And you I'll, run and I'll into say, situations where someone kills it with the whole interview panel and they blow all four of your check marks on that test? So in the old days, we used to bring them into the office. Now we don't. They never make it to me. So like my Smart. mom- So you my, test them first. Yeah. So I love this. So for everyone listening to this that wants to think of testing, this is incredibly important. Because what I found with testing was this. If you tested after people had already interviewed, it was they would try to explain the test away. Yep. Because they've already met worthless. the person. And you know what? Sometimes they, they, the test was wrong. Tests aren't perfect. Um, but more often than not, you regretted it because they were a good actor. And we did the same thing. You tested, we looked at it, and we decided whether we were going to invest time in you or not. You can think that's fair. You can think that's unfair. I don't really care because it's my money and I'm spending it on, on the people. And when you start spending your own money on hiring employees, you can test them after if you'd like. So this is a funny story. There was a kid, he was a, he's three or four years older than me. His mom is friends with my mom. And I got a text or a phone call. I'm like, hey, so-and-so applied for a job. Now, it's also in the back of my head that this kid was always older than me, always was a dick. Like he could have been nice and he wasn't, he was just a dick. <laughs> so my mom calls me up and she said, hey, so-and-so applied for a job. And I told my mom straight faced, had the guy been nice, maybe I would have bent the rules. But I told my mom straight faced, I said, look, with my job ad is a link to two tests. The first one is the PI, the predictive index, and the second is the cognitive. If it makes it to me, he passed those two tests. If he didn't, he's not the right job fit, so it'll never make it to me. So just tell the lady that you know that we've got a pretty rigorous hurdle program. And if he doesn't make me, it's, you know, no offense. He's just not the right fit for that particular job. And it weeds him out. So it's two things. It prevents you from wasting a lot of steps. And if someone who's friends with your mom ever applies, you just blame the test. It's fantastic. I love it. I, you know, it, and, and it's not just a test that you need, right? So the test could have too many red marks, but, um, I'm big on reading your application um, and on an application, I love to see how you write about your previous employers. So I always put a question on there, which is why did you leave your last job? Um, which is one of the most important things that I read on any job application. And I love to see, is there a pattern of you destroying the manager from previous places? And why in the hell would I think I would be any different? I'm also looking for grammar. I'm looking, do you write? Did you take your time? You're submitting something to a company and ask for a job. If you can't take the time to get your grammar right on an application and you're in a position where you're going to interact with customers, how sloppy are you going to be when you interact with my customers? That just denotes a lot for me. So I think it's pooled risk. I think I'm looking at an application. I'm looking at your resume. I'm looking at your interview. I'm looking at your test. Um, when you go do a background check, Someone has a DUI on their background check. It's not enough for me to bounce them. But if you have three, there's no way in hell you're getting a job with me. Or if you have a DUI and I was in financial services, so I had to pull their credit. If your credit was a disaster and you had an offense on your background, how in the world am I going to have you managing other people's finances? So for me, when you look at, I love Polian's too many red marks that a manager has to, to evaluate risk. And when we evaluate risk, we're looking at multiple data points. And if there are just too many in the wrong direction, we're going to go a different direction. Let me, let me say two things here. I want to do them in order. The application. When I applied to NVR, most of the applications were computerized. NVRs, of course, wasn't. In my company, I don't read as much as others. I read enough, but I've got people that are the readers. Ian, and if Ian worked here, he'd be one of the readers. He gets a lot of stuff from reading. So he'd be the one who screens it. Now I'm not the reader, but I got someone who does that. But let me go back to the MVR application. It wasn't computerized. I am a God awful speller. I know that. So I had to hand write this freaking thing. I answered every single question in my laptop. I typed it. I spell checked it and then I went back and rewrote it by hand into the document. It took me forever. It's the job I wanted and I knew someone was going to read it and I didn't want to look like an idiot who couldn't spell and get kicked out. So I didn't. 
and and you know frank is frank is a smart guy but he doesn't enjoy writing it's not a it's not a talent of his or a skill of his or it could be if he enjoyed it more but you were smart enough to know that you wouldn't even get a chance to explain to someone that writing isn't your thing if you didn't write it well because it would just get bounced out of the pile if if i have to evaluate a hundred applications the 20 with grammar and spelling errors are out first. They're just out. I'm sorry. Like that, that's not my job to send it back to you and say, you know, you might want to look at a few of these things, get your shit together. If you want a job from me, it's, we talked about this in a previous episode. I communicated with my wife first through text and a dating app. And I misspell, I, I use, I didn't misspell it cause I spell checked it. It was, I used the wrong grammar. I used the wrong word. And like, she blew me off. So the other thing that I think is is, is worth talking about. Look is at this, this Neanderthal. Exactly. And she's partially right, yeah. but I'm a great salesman. Um, but here's the other thing that I think I want to talk about here before we move on to something else. A DUI. I come across them all the time. If you've got three, you've got an uphill battle. I think that's a decision-making problem. Uh, and yeah, I'm not going to throw you out because of it, but... You better have some damn good answers. Yeah, I would. I but like I'll I interview even, you. I wouldn't I'll interview even blank. You. I wouldn't even blank. You're out. Okay. Ian and I have different criteria on this, but I'll tell you this: I don't care if it's one or if it's three. If you don't have a good story, you don't have a compelling story. You can't tell me what it did for you. What's changed? You're allowed to make a mistake. Ian and I have made mistakes. I have a DUI on my record. I admitted it in an interview. I remember telling my dad that. And he goes, Frank, what the F were you thinking? Stop letting that follow you around. And in the 90s, it wasn't as easy to track. But what I found, took it head on. I didn't lie about it. And what I did is I said this, I have one. One of the worst days of my life. Let me tell you why it was a terrible day. Let me tell you the next 12 months after that day, what I did, how I did it how it's fundamentally rewired me, how I realized I was this close to getting yanked out of school. These are the things that happened and I turned it into something positive. If you've got a negative, if you got three negatives, you might need to lie. If you have a negative and you can talk about what you did with it to turn into a positive and how you became a better person, that is critical. And it's- human. We're going to find out anyway. That's so it. You may as well just bring it out. It. We're going to find I, out anyway. I've asked people, like, is there anything else you want to talk about in an interview? Just so you know, five years ago, I had a DUI. It's the only thing on my record. You're going to see it. Do you have any questions about it? That is heroic. Love it. I trust you so much more because you just told me that. And let's talk about it. Did you have fun tonight? You got a DUI? Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about the serious part. And let's go through it and have a real dialogue. That is what separates you in an interview. Making a mistake. People, Frank, I've told people we're going to do a background check and ask them, is there anything you'd like to share with me? And them say no. And then there's a DUI in the report. And you're like, did you think I was bluffing? Did you like, that was your chance. Just say it. I, I, I'm, I'm no saint myself. And the reason why I just say three, Frank, is you haven't learned a damn thing. You just, There's a character you, problem. You, can, you, you can't three. tell me three stories. You have a problem yeah. or you're just irresponsible, but you, you can tell me three stories all you want. You're irresponsible. Yep. Well, the only caveat to that, I would say, Ian, is there was three of them 20 years ago. You've done something about it and there's been nothing there since. I've seen that and I've looked the other way on it. I've looked the other way on things on a record that I probably shouldn't have because I gave someone a shot. More likely than not, it's bit me in the ass, but in some instances, it's made a lot of sense. But you've got to weigh those things. As a hiring manager, you have to make decisions. You have to use legal and all kinds of other stuff. If you're listening to this and there's a wart on your resume, we all have them have a story and a compelling e reason and you work around it. And that's the Bill Polian thing. Is it a red mark or is it multiple red marks? And you've got to be able to kind of put a tourniquet around it. You know, and what's crazy, Frank, is I, I, I know some people with multiple blemishes on their records that I know very well 
and I would hire them in a second, but I know them very well. They're incredible people. If I don't know anything about you, but an interview and your record, I just can't, I, there are other, I move on to the next thing. Uh, that, that's all. So, so I, we're going to get, get kind of getting sidetracked here, but I, I think it's worth it. Let's say you're listening to this and you're trying to interview for a job. And you had a, a wild decade or you had some major screw ups over a period of time. A calculated move would be to turn multiple blemishes and sell it as a blemish. Sell it as this was a period in my life where I didn't have a lot of guidance. I went out and did these five things. I, I had a wild streak. It could be summarized here. So in my is, royal oats. This is how I, the second movie was terrible. This is how I can, I've overcome this. And this is a body of work that's now five or eight or 10 years or 20 years in the making. And you take a multiple blemish thing and you sell it as a package of something. Because if, if you're listening to this and you had a bad period, you're going to have an uphill climb to find a job in a, in a good economy with low unemployment. So you've got to steer your narrative and you've got to own your shit. Like those are the things that are going to get you a chance. So number four, pedigree is important, but not that important. So uh, Rick Meyer and Brady Quinn were both quarterbacks for Notre Dame uh, and they were quarterbacks for very good Notre Dame teams, loaded Notre Dame teams. Uh, Rick Meyer went second overall. Brady Quinn went 22nd. They were both nice quarterbacks on amazing teams with storied traditions, um, but they both were way overdrafted for their talent at the next level. So their success had more to do with the program they were in and the talent they were surrounded by. Two other examples, the Bears drafted Cade McNown and Rex Grossman in the first round. Neither of them were solid NFL quarterbacks or had the really the talent to be elite quarterbacks, but they played on ridiculously good teams, which made them look better. As a Florida Gator, I take offense to the sexy Rexy because he was a great Gator, but you're, he was you're, a great Gator. But can we talk about who he was throwing to? I mean, exactly. when you got Percy Harvin in your backfield. I'm kind of disappointed you didn't put uh, Danny Warfel on the list. Tend to look better. Danny Warfel, that was another good one on there. Um, uh, Matt Leinert it sticks out as another one, right? Just on an absolutely all-time team. Uh, went uh, He went second or first or second in that draft to the Jets. Um, you know, and the opposite is Gino Toretto. He won a, won a Heisman Trophy but and two national championships. He's on one of the most dominant college football teams ever, Miami teams. Um, but teams were smart enough to know it's because you were surrounded by outrageously good athletes, offensive linemen, your running backs were great. Your receivers were great. And he didn't go until the seventh round, which was smart. And on the other end of that spectrum, you've got guys like mean Joe green from North Texas, Walter Payton, Jackson state, Jerry rice, Mississippi Valley state, Michael Strahan, Texas Southern. So I think for me, the takeaway here, and I think a lot of managers get caught up when they see a resume come across their desk that says Stanford on it, or it says uh, Georgia Tech, or it says UVA, and they get excited. And, and I can tell you, I hired for a decade in Virginia. I hired from Virginia Tech. I hired from University of Virginia, and I hired from JMU. And out of those three, Frank, which one has the biggest reputation as the Brainiac School? I mean, it certainly isn't JMU. It certainly isn't JMU. UVA is the hardest to get into by far. Yeah, it's, like it's the highest ranked of all of it. And I can tell you, I, I had much more success with JMU students than I did UVA. And that's not, this is not knocking UVA by any stretch of the imagination. But just, how, I went one year and I heard like eight kids from UVA. And I was like, yeah, we're getting after it. We are raising the bar. We are getting talent. And like most of them didn't stay. They all wanted to go get MBAs or, you know, they wanted to get, they really just wanted jobs with consultants. They were so caught up in the pedigree of the school that they went to. Whereas in the JMU kids came in and just worked their asses off and, you know, were appreciative of the job. They came from kind of blue collar backgrounds. Um, 
They weren't recruited by the same big schools coming out of high school. So they kind of had a chip on their shoulder. I, I've personally done better hiring from not small schools, but not the top 25s. Yeah, it, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, you're talking at GE, my guess is you'd have a hell of a lot better chance of placing someone and retaining them back when you were there from UVA. Ryan Holmes is not that kind of pedigree. And it, it, it's more of a blue collar type of a pedigree in person. And you got to kind of know that just like I know here, I don't go after people with those big degrees or five degrees. I go after people that are workers that are from, because it fits the job. Let's get into projects. So how would you define a project? If we're using the NFL, I would say a project is Randy Moss when he was on the Raiders. I would talk about someone who is um, someone who is maybe a character issue, maybe someone who doesn't have the, the skill but as a hard, it's, it can go both ways. You can use like a Wes Welker who played for the Dolphins that was mostly a special teams guy and you find a, a spot for him. Or you could do the opposite, which is where you find someone who's certainly talented, but who's underperforming. So, yeah. So, you know, in the NFL, a project is largely going to be someone, let's stick with college at least for now, is going to be someone who played on a small team. So they played against weak talent. So there it's really hard to evaluate was Tony Romo any good playing for Eastern Michigan and beating up on Miami of Ohio instead of playing for Michigan and beating up on Ohio State? That's a very different situation, those two things, and playing against that kind of talent. So, you know, these are more projections that people take chances on. And there's a, a, an incredible list of a Hall of Fame talents like James Harrison, Antonio Gates, that Kurt Warner – that went undrafted, but someone took a chance on him and invited him to camp. Um, and to me, what this just makes me think about is my favorite at even if Fortune 500 companies, I tend to work with these people now. Um, I love to spot people without a lot of experience that are very general in what they bring to you, right? They bring hustle, work ethic, an ability to learn, they're coachable. Um, that aren't very specifically trained yet, but have a lot of upside. I've done much better with these kind of hires and it, it always kind of surprises me that companies aren't willing to hire more kids without any experience whatsoever. Um, and, and I don't know, do, do you think Frank that that's, they don't have the organization to train them. They don't have the wherewithal to teach them the business. They don't know how to handle a new person. Is it, are they against hiring millennials or Gen Y? What is it? Or do they just feel like they need experience or you're not going to perform? You've heard this story. I'll tell you, I'm going to answer your question with a story. So I was in a back room with one of the mayor candidates um, for Richmond and I got invited there. Now, of course, when you get invited to these, you're told to also branch check. But I was in the room and the mayor, she, she ultimately lost. And she, her, the message was confusing. And I looked at her and I was like, do you know the difference between a feature and a benefit? And she didn't really have a great answer. And I, I went through the difference between a feature and a benefit. And I use it for the city of Richmond. And I told this story. And it was very relevant to Richmond. And the man who put the meeting together is like 80. And he looks at me, he goes, where'd you go to college? I'm like, the University of Florida. He goes, did you learn that there? And I was like, no. no. <laughs> but what was relevant about that is he's an 80-year-old kind of dinosaur. He thinks you're getting this from college. So people who don't know how to hire or cultivate talent go back to, hey, look at the resume. Look at where this person's pedigree is. Look at, look at these things. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, if you're a good leader, if the person's got the fundamental skills, I talked about four things that matter. If you've got those four things and some experience, I can cultivate you. Now, I've got a 30-person company. I don't have a 1,000-person company. But if you went to NVR, NVR would hire English majors and business majors to build houses because they had a good enough program to teach you. So it very much is relevant to the program 
and the thing around you. So, you know, if you're looking to spot some talent like this, one, it's affordable. You're going to get a ton of hustle and you're going to get someone entry level. You don't have to pay a lot of a rookie contract is not expensive. So, you know, for me, when I dive into it, if you've got weak work experience and you've just graduated college or maybe not even graduated college, I'm going to ask, what are your earliest jobs? Tell me about when you've worked a couple, have you ever worked two jobs at one time? What kind of team experience do you have? Did you, did you work your way through college? What would tell me about a time where you had to balance a lot on your plate? I'm going to dive into sports, extracurricular. What was your role? Have you been a leader before? All of those things, I think, translate as much as work experience does um, to the work world. And you can do it in a way and you can spot some really good talent that, that most of the people I promoted into leadership roles didn't have any vocational experience when they started with me at either big company I worked for. So number six. Um, hire for need, but make room in your business for special talents. And I'll start with a quick story here. So the Lions are always a laughing stock, but in 2003, they took Charles Rogers. He flamed out after a year and a half smoking too much weed. One year later in 2004, they took Roy Williams, a wide receiver with their first round pick out of Texas, who ended up becoming an okay receiver, not great. One year later, they took Mike Williams, another wide receiver out of USC, who flamed out. He ate too much. He was kind of fat and didn't really get into good shape. So the Lions were kind of a laughing stock under Matt Millen of all they do is draft receivers that don't work out. Um, they took 2006 off from wide receivers, and they were still kind of this laughing stock. And in 2007, with a top draft pick, they took Calvin Johnson another wide receiver. So four wide receivers in five years. It was not a need to take Megatron at the time. We did have a bunch of receivers, but he was a very special, special talent. And it's turned out to be one of the few smart moves I think they've ever made in the draft because he single-handedly got us to the playoffs a few times by jumping over two or three different defenders at a time and doing some otherworldly things on that team. But it wasn't a need but they recognized he was the absolute best playmaker in the entire draft. And it was a bold move to take them after they had dropped the ball on a few others. I think they took him hoping that there was those other players were going to be him, but luckily they got one of them, right? The thing with Mike Williams, it's fascinating is he played at USC and he sat out a year before that was like popular or because of COVID related because he had just a bunch of crap and they still drafted him up top. Why don't you tell the story in about like going to NBR and why they hired you and how that whole thing works? I think that's a really relevant story to use here. So uh, me getting hired into NBR was similar to um, the, the story that we're telling here. There was already a region manager in Virginia. Um, he was a great guy and he was probably like five years from retiring. and. Um, they, had, they were out looking for new region managers that didn't have mortgage experience. Our CEO wanted to kind of go get a fresh perspective on the finance business. And um, a friend of mine who had just joined NBR and who worked with me at GE was doing a good job for Ryan Holmes at the time. And Paul Seville just asked him, is there anyone else at GE that's maybe not happy, maybe in the same place you were at that's got talent? And Max said, yeah, I know a guy, Ian Matthews, he's incredible. Uh, you know, he worked with me. And so Seville went after me and really liked me, but he already had a regional in Virginia and he wanted me locally could be because he wanted to kind of teach me the business and for me to work in McLean at the time that was our headquarters. And so he went ahead and hired me anyway and made me a co-regional with Mike Fernandez, who's still a good friend of mine. Um, and we worked together for three years, but it was not a need. It was not a business need totally. Now he knew I would come in and help Mike. I had a different way of looking at things and he knew I would make Virginia better because I would have a different perspective. But it, it, it was kind of a, hey, this is lightning in a bottle. We could get this guy from GE right now. He seems unhappy. And they hired me. I ended up staying with the company for 13 years, moved into bigger and bigger roles until I was running pretty much the whole company, all of the regions. Um, but at the time they hired me, my position was not a need 
they went and hired me anyway, knowing there was going to be growth in the company and they would need leadership talent. So when you're in a big company, you can do this a little bit more than you can with a smaller company. But I did it too. There's a guy that works for us who's critical to our success and incredibly important and, and, and great. And we brought him down in sales, but I quickly realized he wasn't really a salesman. He was had so many other talents that we weren't tapping into and we kind of found a spot for him. So sometimes what you got to do is go find talented people, bring them in. I meet with somebody on Thursday who is fits this role. Like, I don't know what the person's going to really do or how they're going to fit in, but they're smart, they're talented. They're from a referral, a strong referral. So those types of things, you're like, you know what? I'll sit down with this person and take a shot. The big companies, the NFL teams, you can do that. The Packers can draft Aaron Rodgers. The Packers can then turn around a decade and a half later and draft Jordan Love, who they can park on the bench for three years because they're the freaking Packers. When you're a smaller business, your window is smaller, but you can still do these things and bringing in talented people and say, let's see where you really shake out. At our tech startup, Frank, um, we had a couple of incredible resumes just fall into our lap sort of um, that didn't they didn't really fit the job postings that we had, um, but they were so like one of them's from the Institute of Technology of India, unbelievable, like PhD in engineering, uh, a decade of consumer tech business experience at Microsoft launching multiple products. So we're looking at them and we're saying, let's create job positions for these. We're growing we're going to need this. We're, we're going to get disorganized. So we've created sort of a chief of staff position. Uh, you know, we'll call it a COO, but similar to what Jeff Bezos does that we talked about, a chief of staff. And we created a uh, VP of hardware position just for these two people, because we were looking at it and we're saying, we want to be a billion dollar company. We have no sales, no revenue. We get that. But we think this could be a billion dollar company. And we're going to need some special talents to get there. Let's lock them up now while we're in this crazy growth mode. And I think that's, I think that's, you got to be mindful of where you ultimately want to go and having a one, three, five, or 10 year plan is critical. In addition to that, it doesn't seem to me like it keep you're hiring too many reclamation projects. And in my business, we don't hire many either. So in the NFL, when you asked earlier, you know, what would you call a project? You'd call them a project, but a project, someone you put on the taxi squad or you say, hey, they're not going to play for a couple of years. That's a project. A reclamation project is more like, hey, you, were, you have all the talent. Maybe your head isn't right. You've been on the wrong team. You're tired of making a ton of money and you want to kind of backtrack a little bit, make less money, but win. So those could be projects. Um, in my business, we don't have a lot of projects because we're a small business. Now, we can make a one or two exceptions because I got a strong enough team where I think we can pull them up and we can, we can decide. But most of the time with a reclamation project, you need to go into it thinking this could end at any moment. This person's got all the talent in the world, but they might not be a cultural fit. And I'm going into it kind of with the caveat of this could end any second. There's company or there's there's football teams that do this well. The Patriots have done it incredibly well. Tampa Bay last year they won the Super Bowl. I think they did it really well, um, but they pulled a bunch of people together and they kind of know it's a soup that might not last very long. Teams that do it terribly. We've already talked about the Raiders, and we'll get into it already and talk about a specific example there. And another team that's terrible at it's the Bengals. They constantly just draft high functioning players that are dipshits off the field. And what Bill Polian would have said is he would have put a red C on their card. They either would have taken them off the board or they said, hey, this is a character person we're probably not going to draft. Yeah. Do not, do not draft, right. Do not draft. And uh, you know, that I think what matters on a lot of these and where they work and where they don't work is where the culture is to start. So the Patriots have a strong locker room so they can bring guys in like Randy Moss, Ocho Cinco, Albert Hainsworth, people that have been a problem to others. And if they don't work, they just get them out. But most of those people fall in line, whereas in the Bengals have a weak locker room. So guys like Pac-Man Jones, Joe Mixon, Vontez Burfecht, Ray Maulaga, all those guys, they all had kind of checkered pass and domestic disputes. And then they come into a locker room that's kind of gross and it just gets more gross, that's it. And so I think if you're gonna take a risk, your culture's got to be rock solid. And if not, you got to pass. Randy Moss, Randy Moss almost went to Florida State, 
first and then Notre Dame or was it Notre Dame, then Florida so State, then Randy, Rome? Randy Moss came from a small town in West Virginia and he was the biggest star, incredibly talented. He enrolls at Notre Dame. And when he enrolls at Notre Dame, he gets caught doing something stupid. I think it was smoking weed. So he, the, the coach at the time goes to him and goes, I, I, I can't have you. He goes, but you're incredible. I'm going to take care of you. So he called a couple of coaches, one of which was Bowie Bowden. And back then there wasn't the portal. You had to sit out a year. So he sits out a year. He's on Florida State's team on the practice squad. He's not even playing. And he gets kicked off the team again for smoking weed, but he played with those guys for a full year. Then he downgrades and goes to a Division II school because he could then transfer again. It's complicated, but basically he could play. So he went to inferior talent. He plays for two years. He ends up basically like the best player around. He could like, this is unheard of. He's up for like the biggest award, the Heisman Trophy, because he was dominating this other town. Like nobody from that level has even won it. He's like the finalist for this award. But the same thing happens in the NFL draft. He ultimately doesn't get drafted until like the 22nd pick and Minnesota picks him, a team that had incredible culture, an incredible coach, great wide receivers. And one of the wide receivers is a guy named, um, Chris Carter, he was a problem 10 years earlier, but he was old enough where at this point he was no longer a problem. And he took Randy Moss under his wing and Randy Moss became incredible, but it was the right place to put a problem. If he had gone right to the Raiders out of college or a shitty team right out of college, it could have blown up. Yeah. If he goes to the lions, maybe he's Charles Rogers, right? Maybe, maybe it falls apart. Maybe Charles Rogers does well in the Minnesota locker room. So if you're going to take, you know, a reclamation project, to me, it might be someone that you um, had to let go of years ago in a different time, different situation, and they've matured a little in their life and you're thinking about bringing them back. I've done this before. Um, you know, you see some of those kind of things or someone's been fired and they learned something from it. Um, but if you're going to do it, you need an established team. You need an established culture. You need to have leaders underneath you that buy into who you're hiring and why you're hiring them. And they have to be on board with it and they need to be part of the solution and helping make sure that person's going to kick some ass. Um, yes. I think number eight, you know, uh, out of, out of lessons is just, you know, even the best programs swing and miss all the time. So, you know, the Patriots are kind of thought of as one of the best when it comes to value and picking up free agents and making the best out of deep draft picks, you know, they found Tom Brady in the sixth round. There's lots of legends around it, but in 2017, they took Derek Rivers, Antonio Garcia, Dietrich Wise Jr. And Connor McDermott. And if you're saying who, household names, Ian household names. Yeah. If you're saying who it's because none of them, ever played. It was literally a completely wasted year. They had four draft picks that year in 2017 and none of the players really made the team or did anything. They gave an entire year up in the draft, which is pretty crazy. And it's also probably why they didn't make the playoffs last year. So even if you are incredible at it, something you should just come to grips with is even the NFL's hard. Sure. But it's hard to hire anywhere and, and have a hundred percent hit rate. You're just, if you're kicking ass, you're, you're probably doing 60, 70% hit rate on recruiting, even with an incredible process. And if your process sucks, you're closer to 20 or 30%. Bill Polian in the, in the interview that I listened to, and he, he went all the way back to um, Vince Lombardi, who's an iconic coach, the Super Bowl trophies named after him. He was so important to the game. He said, you'll bring in 25, if you're lucky, you've kept five. So that's a five out of 25 is one out of five, which is a 20% retention rate. In corporate America, we're better than 20% because you're looking at freak athlete, athletics and things like that. But what I think is important, and Ian and I have talked about this, is you got to own your mistakes. In the NFL, there's a bunch of examples of this. Um, Ryan Leaf came out of college he was a number two pick behind Peyton Manning and the Chargers, who we talked about, also cut bait pretty quick with Drew Brees when he hurt his shoulder. They cut bait. They said, that's enough. You're out. They gave him two years. The opposite was the Packers, smaller market team. They held on to Tony Mandarich for years, three or four years. Ian, why don't you talk about that with like, you know, the difference in, and why? So Tony Mandarich, so Ryan Leaf and Tony Mandarich were both very high profile players. Uh, Ryan Leaf went right behind Peyton Manning and there was a big 
conversation of whether he was better than Peyton. Tony Mandarich was an offensive tackle that was, you know, another one of these combine monsters, you know, bench pressed millions of pounds and pancaked lots of people. He was strong. Um, and the and the hype got so big that the Packers took him. Well, it turns out he was on steroids for all of that. And once he got to the NFL where the testing was harder, he couldn't do what he did before when he was on those steroids. So uh, from the first practice of training camp, the Packers knew Tony Mandarich wasn't the guy that they drafted. And the crazy part about Tony Mandarich is he went second in that draft. Right after him went Troy Aikman, Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders, three iconic Hall of Fame <laughs> NFL players. And what the Packers did was they had this sunk cost. Now their ego was on the line. They took this lineman ahead of three incredible players. They looked silly. And so what they did is they tried to play him for three years, three seasons. They kept running him out there and he kept getting steamrolled by everybody. And they lost a lot of games and they got a bunch of quarterbacks hurt because they kept putting a really terrible player on the field to protect their ego instead of just saying, you know what we missed. And I think the lesson here, Frank is in hiring Put your ego aside. When you get it wrong, when you get it wrong, hire slow, fire fast. And you normally know pretty early, oh man, this is not the person I interviewed. They're not getting, there's something off. They're not getting along with your team. They're awkward. They're pushing back on everything. They're showing up late. They're, they're showing signs way too early for someone who's only been with you a few weeks. So we have, I have two quick stories I'm going to go through on this and we can wrap this thing up. Um, I bought a company. So I bought a whole company. It was a small company, but I bought a company. And that's a pretty big thing. It's a big cost. And it turns out the company wasn't that great. It turns out what I bought was a lead assistant and a process. They had a process better than us, but I hired people from this company. I brought them in. It, was, it made the paper. And ultimately what I ended up having to do is I had to say, this isn't working out and I got to let you go, but I'm going to keep your process and I'm keep just one employee. And I'm going to, I'm, I paid you a bunch of money. So I'm going to enforce the non-compete. I'm sorry, but it you, took about you pretty much bought IP. That's what you yeah, bought. You bought, but I didn't think I was buying IP when I bought it. I thought I was buying some talent, but it turns out I wasn't, but in my forties, I made that decision a hell of a lot faster than I would have in my twenties. I would have, I would have ridden that thing out and marched Tony Mandarich out there and had his ass beat for year over year. <laughs> Instead, I said, this isn't working. We need to let you go. You would ask, we talked about DUIs earlier. And one of the more harsh things that we ever did is on Christmas Eve, we fired somebody. Turns out the reason we fired him is he lied. He told us he used to drink. He doesn't drink anymore. He admitted to one of the people that he had a DUI, but he didn't come clean and he didn't have two or three he had at least three and he had like an open misdemeanor where it seems like he might've had a fourth and he lied to us. And he said, Hey, I don't drink anymore. And we caught him at a party, like sneaking off and doing shots. So it was harsh. I was out of town. And I was like, I called back to the office. I'm like, you guys got to fire this guy. We just got the data. He's worked for us for four days. He's got to go. And um, that's what we did because it's harsh, but that's what we had to do. So you learn pretty business hardens you. It's not, it's not great, but sometimes it does harden you and you have to make those tough decisions. Yeah. I've, um, I've, I've fired someone on their first day of work because we, you know, we hired them saying, look, your background check needs to still come back. Is there anything you want to tell me right now? Did you misrepresent anything on this application? Is there anything? No, 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 no. Okay. Then they start day one HR calls me, Hey, look, they got some things on the background one of them was they lied about going to college and I confronted the person and they said, well, you know, I took some classes. I said, you took some classes. You wrote down that you had a bachelor's degree on this resume and your application. You told me you did. No, I don't actually. I really you know, only have a few semesters. And it was like, well, you can go ahead and pack up and leave. And she was like, how could you do this? I already left my other company. I already... And I said, look, how am I supposed to, I, we knew, you knew you were starting contingent on having told me the truth. How can you and I have a business relationship? If you lied about something this big, what else are you lying about? I can't trust you. And I didn't, 
she tried to pull up my heartstrings, you know, that I left another job and now I'm out here and I wasn't going for it. It was, that's, that's too bad. You should next time don't lie. And by the way, this was not a position that needed a college degree. And yet she chose to lie about it, which I'd still, I, I don't know, but it, you know, to me that saved me her doing that. So I, I've, I've fired someone as quickly as one day when I've realized they weren't who they told me they were going to be. It's the 21st century. Information is everywhere. You need to be honest. You're going to get caught. So I think, I think Frank wrapping this up, I think I, there are so many things you can do to minimize errors, which is, I think the first rule of hiring is first do no harm. There's, I would much rather miss out on a great talent, Frank, than hire someone who becomes a major problem in my business. Would you agree with that? If you had the choice of two mistakes, I missed a good talent or I hired someone that got into my organization and started stirring it all up. I can always find other talents. Everyone's going to remember the bad hire that messed everything up in the business. Yeah. It, hopefully like I've gotten to the point where one hire is not going to do that, but yeah, it, you, you, you got to pick the steady Eddie over the one that could potentially rock the apple cart. Yeah. So I, I think you want to minimize mistakes. First, do no harm. You want to make sure that you're measuring the right things. You're asking the right questions. You're looking at the right game tape. You're, you're putting the right context on it. You can do all those things, but it still comes down to the fact that context and environment matters. If you can't build a good culture in your organization, just hiring great talent won't change your organization. You'll be the Jaguars, you'll be the Browns, you'll be the Dolphins and the Lions. You'll hire some of the best talent every year. They'll come in, they'll quickly start performing lower than their, their capabilities because of the halo effect. They'll perform at the same intensity level of the rest of your locker room. Focus on your culture, then bring in great talent and let them bring you up. If you don't, your culture is going to bring them down. I agree with everything you said, and I'll, and, and I'll reframe it this way. Teams that win a lot, companies that win a lot, have strong ownership. If we're going to make a questionable hire, I'm on board for it. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. There's decisions that go into it. You it's know the not, risk. It's not flippant. It's not just a matter of fact. It's very much debated. And it isn't debated by me and nobody else. It's debated amongst the leadership team that are going to be working with this person and have to deal with it. We did a, a whole episode about how Urban Meyer made a decision in a vacuum and how we disagreed with it. We are not an NFL franchise, but we still don't do that. Like if we have something questionable, we talk about it as a group. Sometime we bring the, form, the, the future employee in and we talk about it. Like we make a decision holistically as a group. And sometimes if you get it wrong, you got to just say, hey, we got to cut paint. But you also have to look at, does this person fit culturally? Will they unwind everything we've worked so hard to build? And if the answer to that is a possibility or a yes, you got to be Michael Jordan for me to give you a shot because it just doesn't make sense. It's taken 12 years for me to get here. I can't unwrap that with one loose decision and I won't. Yeah. And I am thankful that you didn't make me take that wonderlick test that Kava company employees have to go through to be your co-host of this podcast. Cause I, you'd probably have someone different sitting here talking to you right now. There's no doubt. I mean, both of us would have failed that there'd be blank microphones. All four of those would be red check marks. This guy's an a-hole. Don't, don't. And judging by the listenership, maybe we shouldn't have done this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey dude, good talking to you. Ian, it's always a pleasure. Go lions. In my opinion, that sucked. What's that? Uh, playoffs? Don't talk about it. Playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game.